It's no coincidence that Gandhi's grandson wrote the foreword to the book that explains nonviolent communication, or NVC. According to Arun Gandhi, his grandfather stressed the need to communicate nonviolently because he saw passive violence, the kind brought about by harsh, judgmental words, as being an underlying cause of physical violence. You're so selfish. That's John Kenyon, mediator and co-founder of the Bay Area Center for Nonviolent Communication, which is an approach developed by psychologist Marshall Rosenberg 40 years ago. NVC involves choosing to hear people's unmet needs beneath hostile language, like what you just heard. So instead of stomping my foot and shouting, I am not selfish, I might hear, I have a need for consideration, for care of others that isn't being met. And I could focus on that as what the person is saying, instead of getting caught up in reacting defensively to a, a criticism. It's the idea of seeing our interdependence. If others' needs aren't being met, then my needs aren't being met. Nonviolence isn't a technique to be used when you need it. And it's not being passive. It's really a philosophical worldview, based in compassion and connection. And Gandhi didn't create it. He adopted the Hindu concept ahimsa, or doing no harm, and took it to new heights. It's one thing to, to be loving and caring and kind to people, but can I do it when others are not being kind at all to me, or the opposite of kind and loving and uh, cruel and oppressive? Can I still have love for that person? And nonviolent communication gives a way to do that by seeing the human needs that someone might be trying to meet, but in a very tragic way, in a very destructive way. If you think this sounds touchy-feely, think again. NVC is used all over the world, in Israel and the Palestinian Authority, in Rwanda, with at-risk teens, between family members. John Kenyon wanted to do something positive after 9-11. So he went to a refugee camp in Pakistan filled with Afghan tribal members. He wanted to teach them nonviolent communication. I believe that if we don't all come together and work together to solve these problems, from the local to the, to the global, I don't think we're going to make it. He was talking with elders from different tribes. Some of them wanted to invite him to mosque, others didn't. They started to fight. They were talking in terms of judgments of what's right and wrong and good and bad and the way it should be or shouldn't be, and maybe criticizing the other side. And I just kept translating that and hearing what their, what their needs were. After much listening, John identified that one group wanted to show him hospitality. The other wanted respect for their tradition of Islam. And then I turned to the whole group after we got the needs on both sides and I said, so. Does anybody in the room not share all of these needs? The needs for connection and sharing and hospitality and the needs for safety and protection and honoring traditions and practices. There was kind of a stunned silence for a second. And then they all started smiling and nodding and you could see that everyone was getting that they all had those needs. It wasn't really, at that level there was no conflict. He suggested they work together to get all their needs met. One idea was to have John sit outside the mosque and hear the service, but that didn't work for everyone. So what was the resolution? The last solution was to have someone sit with us that could explain what was going on in the mosque and uh, what was happening, and we could see and be really right part of it, but we'd still be outside the door and not inside. The tribal elders recognized how John had teased out their common ground. They laughed and clapped and talked together for a long while, and maybe, just maybe, the seed of a nonviolent way to communicate was planted. For Philosophy Talk, I'm Polly Stryker.